Well, welcome to the Radio Bible Class. I'm Robin Crouch, one of the pastors here in New Baptist Church. It's our privilege to have you joining us today. Today we continue our series of lessons from uh, the parables of Jesus found in Luke's Gospel. You know, uh, as we begin, questions come in all sizes. Uh, there are pint-sized questions, you know, those little ones, like uh, where do you live or how old are you or uh, what's your name? No thought, just pint-sized questions. Then there are the gallon-sized questions like, what, what will you or do you do for a living? Um, you know, and we have to think a little about what, what do we want to be or that. But then there are the barrel-sized questions. What are you living for? Who are you living for? Take some pondering and some thought. Found that Great minds don't have fewer questions, they just have bigger ones. The bigger questions. Today, Jesus answers one of the biggest questions ever asked and a biggest question ever to challenge our human minds. And it's interesting, he answers it with a parable. Now, there are four parts to this story, to this uh, episode in Jesus's life. There's a personal question from a teacher of the law. There's a powerful command from Jesus in response. The teacher then of the law then asks a petty question trying to dodge the issue. And then Jesus finishes the encounter with a penetrating question. So let's read uh, from uh, this story of Jesus, one of the most familiar in all of Scripture. Most of you have heard it, at least you know about it. It's from Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Trying to justify himself. And he said, Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring uh, on oil and wine. But then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend I will repay when I come back. Now which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor? to the man who fell among the, th the robbers. And he said to him, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Pray with me. Our Father, I give you thanks for the opportunity we have to be in this place this morning and to join our hearts and our minds together by the medium of radio. I pray that as uh, we look at the story that Jesus told, that you'd allow it to take root in our own hearts. You'd open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have to say to us as individuals. And, oh God, that you'd give us courage in our hearts then to understand and courage in our wills to obey you, to do what you say. Oh God, again, we give you thanks, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this, as we look at this passage from Luke, 
The setting begins, the text here begins with a very personal question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question was asked by one who was trained in the law. For the Jew, eternal life meant the quality of life we will enjoy when in the age to come. All of history for the Jew was divided into this age and the age to come. It was their hope to enjoy here and now in this age some of the quality of life which they would have in its fullness in the age to come. Eternal life is not something they had to die to get. They could receive it now. They could begin to experience eternal life in the moment. In this case, the teacher was not really looking for information but he was trying to set a trap for Jesus. Now, not falling for the trap, Jesus answers with a question. I remember some of my training uh, when I was doing campus ministry was to listen, uh, but when you knew someone was trying to trap you into or corner you into a, to an untenable position, simply to respond to their question, with another question. I can remember people saying, well, uh, you know, did Adam have a navel? Or, how, and again, you even see it in Scripture, how many angels can fit on the head of a pen. But I learned, my, I always would respond this way. If I answer your question, will you become a Christian? Most often they would say, well, no. And I said, well, then I'm not going to answer your question. You see, Jesus didn't fall in the trap of this guy. This teacher was setting a trap. He wasn't really asking an honest question. And so Jesus answers the question with a question, saying, you already know the answer. What does the law say? You're a lawyer. You're one of the, the sect of the law. You've studied it. You know what the law says. And the teacher then gives the right answer. But he realized now he's caught in the trap he tried to set. See, Jesus says, what's the law say? And he repeats, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mold, si heart mind, soul, and spirit, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that, you got it. Now, go and do that. Jesus' response was a powerful command. He said, you know what to do. Go do it. The teacher gave the proper answer. I'm sure he felt pretty good about it. The teacher knew the right answer, but it's not enough to have your facts straight. It's not enough just to know the right answer. We've got a church full of people got all the right answers. <laughs> but not all of them are living the way they should. Jesus says, do this and you will live. The teacher had no problem with the loving God part. But the neighborliness, well, that bothered him. You see, for this teacher, neighborliness belonged within the covenant people, within those who were just like him. Somewhere deep inside him, though, he must have known that that wasn't right because he tries to justify himself with the next question. Trying to find a loophole somewhere so he can save face in front of Jesus. So he asked the teacher this petty question. He asked Jesus, okay, well, who's my neighbor? Now, that seems like an honest question, except when you look at it, what he was asking was this. Jesus, tell me who my neighbor is. I'll go love them so I can check it off my list. We've got people today, followers of Jesus, who live their lives that way. They look at the Bible as a, as a, as a book of rules. They want to look at God and say, tell me what to do. I'll do it. So I'll check it off my list. So I'll live that way. I'll check it off my list. And you've got to do whatever, you want, whatever they want you to do for them. And that's not it at all. That's not, we don't live in a, in a checklist faith. It's not so, you know, well, tell me who I can, tell me who to love. I'll go love them, 
check it off my list. Uh, tell me what words to say, I'll say them so I can check it off my list. Tell me what words not to say, and I won't say them. Check it off my list. You see, that's a legalistic way of living. Uh, that's a contractual way. Do this, do that. And we live in a covenant. Jesus didn't say, do this and do this and do this. What he said is to follow me. Now, there are some do's in that. There are some things that describe what our lives are like when we follow Jesus. <laughs> but I tell you what, we've got too many people who want to be told what to do so they can check it off the list so they think they're okay with God. When in fact, what God wants is to say, look, follow me, follow me. But rather than argue, you know, because what the, what the teacher here wanted or what the lawyer wanted was for Jesus to say, you're okay. <laughs> and boy, we have a lot of churches telling people who are living in sin that they're okay. And that, that's a, for another time. But rather than argue, in response, Jesus tells a story. Now, again, parables are stories that start out being about someone else and end up being about uh, the one to whom they're told. Starts out being about someone else and ends up being about me. Now, look at the parable. The story really sets neighborliness against selfishness. And if you look through and read this, we read through uh, we can see there are four attitudes that come out of this passage uh, toward neighborliness. The first one is the thieves, and their attitude was what's yours of mine is mine if I can get it, if I can take it. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, so get all you can and protect yourself. And if you can't protect yourself, you deserve losing what you have. Sometimes we all wish we were the Great Danes rather than Chihuahuas in, in the dog fight, don't we? For whatever reason, this is selfishness. The thieves, what's yours is mine if I can take it. The second attitude we see in this passage is that of the priest and the Levite. What's mine is mine if I can keep it. Although they would never take something from someone else, they were protecting what was theirs. They probably rationalized why they couldn't help. You know, here it says they went to the other side of the road and kept on going. Uh, may, maybe they thought that this guy was just a decoy and that they would be robbed. Uh, maybe they thought they should work to help the entire race, not just one individual. Or maybe they thought I'm on my way to an important church meeting and I just can't take the time, I can't be late. or in a more sinister way, they may have thought, nah, he deserves what he got, what he got for traveling by himself. You know, the dullest people become brilliant when searching for reasons not to do something. Now think about that. The dullest people become brilliant when searching for reasons not to do something. I remember working, uh, I worked when I was in seminary for Louisville Gas and Electric when I was doing some doctoral work there. And I worked, uh, I worked the front door, which is where people came in who either uh, didn't, couldn't, wouldn't, hadn't paid their bill and their services had been shut off. And they came to see me to see how much of the bill they had to pay to get turned back on. I can tell you story after story after story of what people, the reasons they gave me why they didn't pay their bill. And most often, they were not grounded in truth. <laughs> but I often said to Becky, to my wife, you know, if they were as creative in finding a job as they were in lying about why they didn't pay their bill, they'd have a job. Now I know that makes me sound cold and hard. And maybe I sound like the priest and the Levite. But you see, some people just want to protect what's theirs or they don't want to do what they need to do. Now, the third, a third attitude in this story is from the innkeeper. 
which is what's mine is yours if you can afford it. You see, most of us spend most of our time here. With the emphasis on personal and property rights here, uh, we simply say you can have what you can afford. Now, the sad thing is we live in a society with people who have things they can't afford and they're in debt up to their eyeballs and that presents another issue, but that's not for today. It's not necessary, and, it, and let me tell you, it is not bad to have things. Jesus not once condemns those who have things. He condemns them for having their priorities in the wrong place or for being selfish with what they have. But it's never, Jesus doesn't, Jesus never once condemns a person for being rich. It's for being rich and hoarding things, and being selfish, being self-centered. In Proverbs 30, warning uh, is given uh, of abundance and need. And in Proverbs 30, it says this, two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? And lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. The innkeeper was neither a villain nor a hero in this parable. He simply was running a business. But he says, what's well, mine is yours if you can afford it. But then you have finally the Samaritan who says, what's mine is yours if you need it. In this story, we must understand the prejudices that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. This would be akin, and I'll go back to my, I'll date myself with this. It would be akin to a black man, black man finding a kkk -er on the road. A Ku Klux Klaner. Say that three times real quick. The Samaritan was moved with compassion. There was no questioning about who was his neighbor. He saw a need and was moved to help. He used what he had to help a person in need. He was absolutely unselfish. Not only did he bind up the wounds of this man, he put him on his own animal, carried him to an inn, took care of him, paid for the, the services at the inn, and then told the innkeeper, you get him better, whatever it is, and when I come back through, I'll pay you for it. Absolutely unselfish. But then Jesus asked this penetrating question. Who was neighbor to him? The teacher is now really trapped. The Samaritan, the one the teacher hated, <laughs> he was the neighborly one. But see, we will, never, we will never be like the Samaritan if we're always asking, who is my neighbor? Who can I love so I can check it off my list? We should ask, whose neighbor am I? Now, what about us? How neighborly am I? We see there are many opportunities to help those in need. You can volunteer in many places. The food pantry here, visiting sick and shut-ins. There are church programs, community outreaches, lots of places where you can serve those in need. But see, life has two sides of the road, doesn't it? There's the victim side and the other side. On the victim side, they're into trouble and in a hurry. On the other side, going to Jericho in a hurry, but in trouble. On the victim's side, there's potholes and problems. On the other side, there's pavement and promises. On the victim's side, there's sacrifice. On the other side of the road, there's success. On the victim's side, you accept your responsibilities. On the other side, you insist on your rights. On the victim side, you embrace someone who fails. And on the other side, you embrace those who succeed. On the victim side, you count the cost. On the other side, you count the offering. 
You see, the story of the Good Samaritan really is about two sides of the road. The question is, which side of the road will you walk on? Do you ask that petty question? Who's my neighbor? See, most of us know the answer to love God with all we have and our neighbors ourselves. But then we ask the question, who's my neighbor? So I can go love them and check it off my list. Do you ask that petty question? Or do you ask, whose neighbor am I? Now I will tell you, this one gets me all the time as I see people, homeless folks, people on the street, and I wonder, what's my responsibility? And I question, just whose neighbor am I? Pray with me, would you? Our Father, I give you thanks for the day and for the opportunity we have to serve you. Now, <clears throat> use your word in us. Oh, God, teach us to more be more like Jesus and to ask, whose neighbor am I? And to live life that way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.